This is an irreverent podcast. Check out irreverent.fm for shows from all our friends. First Corinthians warned you about the women with a loud mouth, and this podcast is just that. Here at the Speaking in Church podcast, we talk all about the regular people and the things that regularly happen to them in the evangelical church. It's a podcast about change, it's a podcast about seeking moral high ground, and it's a podcast for people who are just trying to deconstruct on the safe side. You can listen wherever you get your podcast, and if you want to be a guest, yes, you, regular person, you can be a guest on the Speaking in Church podcast. If you want to come on, just let us know. Hello and welcome to Exvangelical. I'm your host, Blake Chastain. Today, I'm re-releasing an episode that I recorded last fall with the author Catherine Stewart, who wrote the book The Power Worshippers, Inside the Dangerous Rise of Religious Nationalism. I'm doing this in light of the rulings in Texas, as well as the ruling that I just woke up to, uh, addressing that Texas law by the Supreme Court. Um, This book is an extremely important book that Catherine wrote that addresses the policies strategies and tactics of Christian nationalist politicians. And we are seeing their playbook play out here in the United States right now. Uh, It is a really fascinating book and extremely informative about the ways in which these organizations lobby and work to achieve their policy and legislative goals. Um, There is an entire chapter called chapter on chapter three, Uh, called Inventing Abortion, and it addresses the ways in which the Christian right has uh, fabricated their supposed history of support of uh, being so-called pro-life. This is not the only book that addresses that. Uh, There are others that address it from multiple angles, but this is one of the most important ones because it addresses so many of the other tactics um, that the Christian right uses to push their Christian nationalist agenda here in the United States. Uh, There is another chapter uh, about a legislative strategy called Project Blitz, um, and it is also extremely informative in the way that these, uh, these actors try to introduce uh, extremist bills uh, in order to eventually find a way to uh, get their goals passed. It is a very, very important book, and I want my listeners to be able to uh, to hear from the author, and please check out the book. Uh, there will be links to purchase it uh, in the show notes, and please follow commentators who can speak to reproductive rights and the Christian right, as well as uh, other aspects of um, politi- uh, politics and the very human impact that these types of legislations are having on the world. Uh, this is, uh, I don't have any, <laughs> have anything, um, you know, extremely uh, enthusiastic or uh, to, to say, to, to wrap this up, this is a, a sort of an ad hoc introduction that I'm making here before I uh, drop this into, into the feed again, because it's very important. Um, this entire season of this show is called Powers and Principalities. It has its own feed, and it addresses Christian nationalism from many different angles. So please uh, go check out that show. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at brchastain. You can follow me on Instagram and TikTok at brchastain underscore. You can uh, support this show through a subscription to my newsletter, the Post Evangelical Post, at postevangelicalpost.substack.com. All right, everybody, let's get to it. Hi, I'm Blake Chastain, and this is Powers and Principalities. This show focuses on the systems and institutions that prop up white evangelical power and influence in America and the world. Season 1 is focused on white evangelicalism and Christian nationalism. This is episode 1. My guest for this episode is Catherine Stewart. Catherine is most recently the author of The Power Worshippers, Inside the Dangerous Rise of Religious Nationalism. Her book provides a comprehensive overview of the various tactics Christian nationalists have used to enact their agendas in American society and politics, from currying favor with the powerful 
and inventing the myth that the religious right's first and primary concern was abortion, to their attacks on public education and how they have mobilized conservative religious voters using sophisticated data modeling. This is a wide-ranging conversation and still only manages to scratch the surface of what is covered in her book. You can find The Power Worshippers at your local bookstore and on Amazon, and you can support the show by purchasing it using one of the links in the show notes. Without further ado, let's get to this conversation. My guest today is the journalist Catherine Stewart. She is most recently the author of The Power Worshippers, Inside the Dangerous Rise of Religious Nationalism. Catherine, welcome to the show. Great to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you for coming on. I really, really enjoyed your book, and I'm excited to talk through all the different things that you tackle within it, um, because I think it, it really summarizes a lot of the different elements of Christian nationalism that we are facing here in the United States today. Where I really want to start is that in your book, in the introduction, you make a distinction that Christian nationalism is not a religious creed, but in your view, a political ideology. You even go further than that and actually say that the ide ideology is not conservative as it purports to be, but is in fact radical. Can you talk about the ways in which you uh, decided to frame um, your work in, in the book and how you approach uh, Christian nationalism? Sure. Um, the representatives of Christian nationalism insist that the foundation of legitimate government in our country is bound up with a reactionary understanding of a particular religion. So it's not a particular religion per se, it's really an anti-democratic movement, anti-pluralist, anti-equality. It basically says the United States is founded on the Bible and can succeed only if it stays true to this foundation. Um, and it's not only an ideology, it's also a device for mobilizing and manipulating large segments of the population by getting them to vote for certain political candidates. Um, and they're, for um, to concentrate power in the hands of the new elite. And one of the things that that is often the case in discussions about Christian nationalists or or evangelicals is actually the fact that a lot of times when we have discussions or the media is covering these groups, uh, the terminology gets a little fuzzy. And one of the things you say also in the introduction is, is that your book isn't necessarily about evangelicals. Oh, absolutely. How, how did you, while writing this book, really approach terminology and the ways in which it is, it can make covering these sorts of things and discussing them at a, on a broad level somewhat difficult? Yeah, well, um, you know, first to your point about evangelicals, the movement includes many evangelicals, but it excludes many evangelicals too. And it includes representatives of a variety of both Protestant and non-Protestant religion. Um, uh, Ultra-conservative Catholics play a, a strong role. Um, I think the, a lot of people underestimate um, uh, the Pentecostal and uh, certain representatives of Pentecostal and charismatic forms of religion as well. What unites the movement is really not a distinct theology. There are a lot of different theological distinctions, but more a common political vision. Um, and in terms of like the language, it is, you know, it's really hard to describe what we're looking at because what we're seeing in America today is something we've, I don't think we've ever quite seen before. 
Um, I make use of a lot of different terms throughout the book. I use the terms religious right, Christian right, um, fundamentalism where appropriate, um, dominionism where appropriate, uh, and, and other terms. I, I use the term religious nationalism in the subtitle of my book, Inside the Dangerous Rise of Religious Nationalism, because I wanted to make clear uh, the similarities with other forms of religious nationalism around the world. So mm -hmm. when we see political leaders in other countries uh, like Russia or, or when we see Orban in Hungary or Erdogan in Turkey or Duda now in Poland, tying, you know, binding themselves to religious conservatives in their countries in order to consolidate a more authoritarian form of political power we rightly recognize that as a form of religious nationalism. We're seeing that in America today with Trump and his alliances with religious hyper-conservatives. Mm. What do you think is the best succinct sort of definition of Christian nationalism? If your your hope is is to make that distinct from a particular type of religious viewpoint like evangelical, for, for instance. And I mean, the evangelical community, uh, that's something, that's the place I come from personally, like there is perennial discussions about what it truly means to be evangelical. If you get really in the weeds, you talk about the Bevington quadrilateral, or whether it's more social or religious or political, like all these different ways in which to approach a term like evangelical. But I do think that there is value in the type of terminology that you put forward of, of saying Christian nationalist or religious nationalist. Um, mm -hmm. So what would be your definition of that as a, as a terminology to be able to identify and classify something as either religious nationalist or specifically as Christian nationalist? Well, you know, nationalism has always in the past and present been a way of uniting people less around some love for a particular identity than hatred for others. Um, you know, paranoia is one of its defining features. And this paranoia often manifests in a persecution complex. It's a way of defining the us versus them, the pure versus the impure, the true patriots or those who are here by invitation only. Um, and um, I think recognizing that paranoia and persecution complex is absolutely essential to recognizing religious nationalism in America today. And I also think we have to note too that religious nationalism in practice almost never comes to an end in genuine theocracy. Some people say, well, aren't these theocrats? Well, what they're agitating for won't really result in a Christian democracy. Uh, the natural destination for this kind of religious nationalism is kleptocracy. Led, you know, led by corrupt, often you know, irrational, nepotistic, autocratic leaders in which organized hypocrisy takes the place of religion. You know, does that sound familiar today? I think it does. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, think. Right. Go on. <laughs> absolutely. I think that that sort of behavior is evident in the ways in which Christian nationalists have taken advantage of the Trump administration as someone as a willing participant to that sort of kleptocracy and disconcern for the rule of law or democracy. It's Absolutely. I mean, these, you know, rather than uniting the population, these kinds of governments tend to deepen existing divides. And you can see this in uh, the hyper-partisanization of the Trump administration. You're with us or you're against us. You're one of the, you know, the good people or you're demonic, like they literally demonize their enemies. You, you notice, um, you know, I've been researching this movement for over a dozen years and have attended innumerable strategy meetings and um, gatherings um, and summits, you know, Valerie's voter summits and the like. And, um, you know, their, you know, their political opponents are not represented as people with a legitimate but different point of view. They're just resented mm -hmm. off, uh, represented um, often as um, truly demonic. <laughs> Which is why I, I actually love the title, you know, uh, power principalities and powers. <laughs> which is, uh, uh, you know, I hear this the rulers of the darkness. I hear this quote from Ephesians used often to represent the sort of political opposition to um, what this uh, movement uh, wants to uh, political opposition to its aims. That is the way in which they mobilize is is by those deeply. Uh, moving sort of religious that religious imagery and, and everything um it's been that way for for decades i actually think that's a good um 
a good segue to a follow-up question in regards to even though that you, you see this more as a political ideology, mm-hmm. um, what is the relation to overall religiosity? We're speaking in, at the end of July 2020. Uh, we're in the midst of a pandemic. Uh, but there are also these, these, these books and articles being published about, um, about this movement uh, as well. And one that was just published yesterday was actually by Robert Jones from PRRI talking about how there's actually a correlation between higher church attendance and and support for the Trump administration. So mm-hmm. like religiosity does play a role, um, but how how can we um, make distinctions or uh, understand the role of the people that are the supporters and maybe what might be different about the leaders of these movements and the people that are actually jockeying for power uh, and doing those things within the within the halls of Congress and elsewhere? Sure. Well, first I want to say that the doctrines of religious nationalism tend to reinforce authority, you know, of scripture, of course, but also the authoritarian uh, authority of, you know, religious and political leaders. And um, these doctrines make an absolute virtue out of or obedience to a literalist or strict interpretation of their religion. And this is very handy, both for the clerics and politicians and the elites that they serve, um, because it reinforces their authority, power, and privilege. So I do think it makes sense when you're examining the movement to distinguish between the leaders and the followers. I think when you're talking about, you know, the, the people who, who um, you know, uh, whose votes are supporting the movement, you know, you're talking about a, a, the rank and file, you're talking about a very a large group of people with a very wide range of interests and concerns. Um, and many of them, you know, when they vote for the, you know, hyper-conservative political leaders that the movement favors, you know, they're really not, you know, they're voting to end abortion or they're voting to defend what they think of as, a, you know, the traditional family or reunite church and state. They're not making arguments for radical uh, reorganization of government as, as it exists. They're really kind of making a statement about their own identity and what they value in themselves. Um, and I think a lot of them would frankly be surprised to learn of all of the policy uh, proposals that their leaders are um, advocating, in particular in the area of economic policy. Mm. But for the leaders of the movement, you know, we're talking about the heads of the right wing policy organizations the data organizations, the legal advocacy groups, um, the legislative initiatives and the like. What they're arguing for is a more authoritative form of government. It's a radically anti-democratic movement. Um, and they you know, want a lot more power for themselves and their networks and the political leaders that they support. And in large part, they want um, a larger uh, share of public funds in order to sustain their movement. Uh, this is something that that has been key part of Republican politics for a long time is that they advocate supposedly for smaller government, but then do um, also fund radical expansions of of government power and government spending. <laughs> Gover- um, government spending for them. I mean, it's interesting. The movement has for years allied itself with libertarian, hyper, you know, conservative, pro corporate wing of the Republican Party. Um, and what they're advocating for are policies that are intensifying economic inequality, which is, you know, I, I mean, you just look at economists and social scientists, this is just very well documented. Our you know, in, income inequality in our country is at sort of really extremely high levels. It's just there's so much further fall down the, the economic ladder. Mm-hmm. And I always find this to be a huge irony in that, um, you know, the religious right is always pretending to support family values, but they're advocating for economic policies that make it so much harder for families to succeed. Mm -hmm. So, like, if you look at the right-wing policy groups, like Family Research Council, they'll say things like government, certain forms of government aid, like um, job training or help with housing or food aid for poor families and things like that. They'll say that this is against the biblical model. But at the same time, they really want to expand, and they are expanding, government funding to uh, right-wing religious organizations and churches so that they can supposedly, you know, deliver these services to people. They want the money to flow through the churches so they can, um, number one, bolster their own organization, get direct government funding of their churches and clergy and right-wing organizations, and also 
deliver um, those services with a certain uh, forms of with certain forms of proselytization, either implicit or explicit. You mentioned the Family Research Council, and I'd love to to talk a little bit about uh, some of the key organizations and the key leaders uh, that are that are part of these groups that are doing the lobbying actively right now. They have been for decades, but then have made a lot of uh, progress towards their goals with during the the Trump administration in particular. In your book, you you talk about attending a Family Research Council event in 2018. Can you talk about what sort of um, what sort of leaders spoke there and what their their goals were and how they were trying to convince pastors to effectively lobby their congregations for these conservative causes? Sure. Well, the Values Voter Summit happens every year. I tend to go every year. It's, it's a gathering of, of some of the most powerful religious right leaders and activists and the politicians that they favor. So at that 2018 Values Voter Summit, uh, Ralph Reed, who's the head of the Faith and Freedom Coalition, he's been in the movement, a movement leader for many years. Um, he's very clever uh, politically. Um, and, and it's all designed to sort of turn out the vote. We were, they were really... Uh, talking about getting the vote for the midterm elections. And Ralph Reed said, you know, if we do our jobs, they're gonna be more shocked uh, this time than they were the last time. He was referring to 2016 and the fact that Mm -hmm. so many, uh, you know, people in the center left um, miscalculated the power of the so-called values vote. Um, You know, the sort of, uh, you know, what, what George Barna, the evangelical, uh, pollster calls the sage cons as sort of most uh, fervent religious right voters. Mm-hmm. So um, Reed also pushed back at that event on the idea that race was a pivotal issue when it came to the vote. He said, if you back the evangelicals out of the white vote, Donald Trump loses with white, with whites. I mean, if you think about it, I mean, to, to see the power of that vote, we can look to that uh, pollster, George Barna, he, this is a movement that represents a minority of the population. Barna um, estimated that the most fervent religious right supporters, a group he calls sage cons, are only 10% of the population. Um, and yet 91% turned out to vote in, in 19, uh, 2016, and 93% of those voted for Trump. So you can see that this disproportionate, uh, this small group uh, punches above its political weight because, um, disproportionately because they're so coherent and organized. Um, at that time, uh, Ralph Reed also said something to the effect of, um, you know, pay no attention to the polls. Our numbers are shrinking. All that matters is who turns out on election day. So all of these uh, different speakers and uh, breakout sessions were all um, intended to sort of turn out the vote. I remember, um, you know, Marsha Blackburn, who's a Republican uh, representative from Tennessee, she was running one to replace Senator Bob Corker at the time. She said something like, you've all heard the Democrats say they're going to have a big blue wave. We have to make sure that blue wave goes crashing into the Great Red Wall. So it was all about turning out the vote. Right. Um, You know, at a breakfast event, I heard religious right leaders say, this election is all about judges, 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 before praying that Jesus would be, quote unquote, restored as king of America once again. I mean, this hits home the fact that a lot of support for a lot of these um, movement leaders is about the courts. I think the movement to an incredibly underappreciated degree derives much of its strategic direction from the courts. Uh, they want judges, judges favorable to their, con- their you know, position, the so-called culture wars, but also judges who are going to vote in economic policies that are favorable to the pocketbooks of the wealthy. I remember, you know, another movement leader, David Barton, saying something to the effect of, um, you know, if I want to know if someone's going to take care of my money, I want to see how they vote on abortion. So abortion becomes sort of the united, they are uniting these sort of hyper-conservative, you know, positions in the culture wars with hyper-conservative economic policy. And that explains a lot of their loyalty. Yeah. Yeah. And that is one thing that your your book also captures well as the sort of the maneuvering around things like, quote, values, votes, and that, that sort of thing as indicators um, of alliance, but also, as you mentioned, uh, the deep financial interest um, that is at stake for a lot of these groups. One of the things that 
sort of cri criticisms that many evangelicals who try to uh, distance themselves from, I believe, I, I forget who who um, came up with the term court evangelicals. It might've been John Fee John or Fee. John Fee. Yeah, it's John Fee. Yeah. Um, they try to distance themselves from that sort of thing, yet even if they do that, they are, there are still machinations happening that support continued Christian nationalist efforts. And they, even though they are utilizing the Trump administration, they predate and will continue to persist after this administration is done, um, after it's done its time. And they, they have certainly tried to stack the courts as you've, uh, during this period, just they're, they're trying to reap what they've sowed uh, in that regard. Um, one of the things that was really eye-opening to me in, in this financial aspect um, in particular was these sorts of interests that were were present at an event hosted by, I believe, Ralph Drollinger and uh, Capital Ministries that you attended. Um, can you talk about the sorts of the the sorts of industry leaders and other leaders that pour a lot of support into these these lobbying groups and other other groups and and how they can also use and and support these types of Christian nationalist initiatives. Sure. I mean, the movement, you know, has uh, various sources of funds, but a big source is, um, are these, um, you know, plutocratic donors, um, many of them belonging to um, hyper wealthy extended families. I'm thinking about the, the Prince DeVos family, the Wilkes brothers, the Mercers, um, McClellan, um, uh, some of the Green family, so many others that I describe in my book. Um, and some, uh, you know, it's interesting, I learned a lot about um, how the theology that's promoted by some of the um, religious leaders is, you know, so favorable to these kinds of plutocratic fortunes. When I attended this event in the San Joaquin Valley for Ralph Drollinger, he's the founder of Capital Ministries, which targets political leaders at the top levels of government. And he's got this weekly Bible study group in the Capitol that's been attended by like 12 current and former members, at least of Trump's cabinet, including Vice President Mike Pence, who's listed on his, as a cabinet sponsor on, on Drollinger's website. And Drollinger also has Bible study groups targeting the Senate and House of Representatives. Uh, and he's establishing affiliated ministries, not only around the world, it's in about 80 countries, but also in every state. So he's arguably one of the most politically influential pastors in America. Mm. So the expansiveness of his positions on domestic, economic, and foreign policy really hits home the fact that this is a political movement, not really a stance of the so-called culture war. So, and a lot of it is about money. So he argues, of course, in his um, uh, Bible studies, which none of it is hidden. It's all on his website. You can look it up. It's, I think, catman.org. And he's published a couple of books on the topic. He's got these Bible studies, which he teaches to these political leaders. And he says, you know, the, he promotes the idea that social welfare bro programs have no basis in scripture. He's against progressive income taxes. He's against taxing the rich proportionately. He at one point goes on some screed about how we need to adopt the flat tax now. Um, he's against government regulation of businesses. He's referred to environmentalism as a false religion. Mm -hmm. um, and he's got a whole bunch of other terrible beliefs, like, you know, women should be subordinate to men at home and in church and things like that. You know, his beliefs are troubling because they are radically anti-democratic. He thinks we need a biblical basis of lawmaking, which, of course, relies on an incredibly reactionary understanding of one particular religion. So, so much for the Constitution. I mean, so much for the values of equality and pluralism that have sustained our country, even as so many others have been torn apart by sectarian conflicts. So much for, you know, rational thought. I mean, his, his vision, you know, uh, explicitly marries conservative religion, hyper-conservative religion with libertarian economic policies that are hollowing out our middle classes and making it so much harder for families across the economic spectrum to succeed. Mm, I, I, yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I mean, I just want to give you one example. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Got, so he cites, uh, I think, the first letter of Peter, 
um, which goes something like, servants be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but to those who are unreasonable. Listen to this. Not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. So Drollinger cites this passage, um, a lot of ways to look at this biblical passage, but he explains, you know, the economy of Rome at the time of Peter's writing was of slave and master, but the principle of submitting to one's boss carries over to today. Think about that. I mean, he's modeling it on the economy of slave and master and submitting to one's boss. And you've got not only the, the good and re gentle, but also the unreasonable. Are you kidding me? I mean, this is music to the ears of the, you know, very wealthy business leaders and plutocratic funders, many of whom are relying on minimal workers' rights and economic and environmental regulation to maintain and increase their profits. Yeah, that sense of, of understanding the Bible as a way to shore up and continue to hoard power and authority is definitely n not a strange teach. It is a strange teaching to an outsider, but to someone even within a quote unquote, moderate sort of evangelical background, those sorts of things, those sorts of ideas have been floating around for decades. But we, what we have here is someone that has access and capital, uh, both social, political and financial capital to the most powerful people <laughs> in, our, in our government. Um, I love so, that you said use the word hoard, Blake, because it's actually, you know, this isn't wealth creation. This is actually a way of of impoverishing the nation. You know, mm -hmm. it's a way of, you know, impoverishing uh, most people while um, folks at the very top are actually hoarding. It just, impover it, it just empowers uh, the people. It's radically anti-democratic. It's, uh, it's uh, cruel and unfair. And, um, you know, it... Um, it, it ensures that that people will be unfairly compensated for for the work that they do. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's it's bad. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> I don't have a clever uh, segue for, segue for that because it when you you know whenever you sit to think on it it, it it's it's discouraging. Um, however, it's true. We, <laughs> and and we can see we can also see that you know this is a theology as you mentioned that has a kind of a, a history. You know, it has roots uh, in mid-century opposition to the New Deal, and I think even further back than that to pro-slavery theology. And, you know, it couldn't be more different from progressive Christian theology that emphasizes racial justice, fairness and equality, care for the poor, uh, and uh, for the undefended. You know, it's a very different vision of Christianity that um, perhaps most American Christians endorse. Right. Yeah, that is one of the things that makes discussing this hard, especially if someone does not have uh, that particular familiarity with these with these types of beliefs or these types of groups. Um, and that's First Corinthians warned you about the women with a loud mouth, and this podcast is just that. Here at the Speaking in Church podcast, we talk all about the regular people and the things that regularly happen to them in the evangelical church. It's a podcast about change. It's a podcast about seeking moral high ground. And it's a podcast for people who are just trying to deconstruct on the safe side. You can listen wherever you get your podcast. And if you want to be a guest, yes, you, regular person, you can be a guest on the Speaking in Church podcast. If you want to come on, just let us know. What is, what is helpful about books like yours is that it contextualizes those things um for an audience that might not be familiar with it and one of the one of the ways in which your your book does that uh, is by talking about another key figure and i'm going to segue to talk a little bit more about the longer history of uh, of christian nationalism um and the different ways in which this group did not emerge out of a vacuum and it didn't emerge uh during during the response to abortion, it didn't emerge with Trump. It's actually been working steadily towards these aims for a very long time. Uh, and one of the people that 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 you, one of those leaders that you focus on uh, as one of these Christian nationalist architects is, I've I've actually never heard his name spoken out loud. I've only ever read it. <laughs> so if I mispronounce it, I apologize. The person is Paul Weyrich. <laughs> 
Um, I had to look it up myself. It's, <laughs> it's um, called Weirich. It's a, it's, I know, but yeah. I'm so glad you mentioned him. Honestly, he was like, I felt like I could write a book just about him. He's fascinating, man. He's like one of the most intriguing characters I've come across in a long time. He was perhaps, you know, he's the leader of a, the, what, a movement called the New Right. It's a precursor mm-hmm. to the religious right of today. And he was perhaps one with the broadest vision. His fellow conservative activist, Richard Vigri, who pioneered the practice of data collection and direct mailing for fundraising, um, said, I can think of no one who better symbolizes or is more important to the conservative movement. What he meant is like a new conservative movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and one of the the most telling quotes that you have of, um, of his is that he saw his aims and his groups as first establishing themselves as first as the opposition, then the alternative, and finally the government. Um, and it's hard to not see that as how it's sort of come to pass, at least in 2020. Uh, you know, I, I certainly have a pessimistic view of things right now. Um, so that might be ta- uh, coloring the ways in which I, I read that quote now, but what, um, how did he help build the new right that became the religious right? And, and how do you think that the Trump administration and the current Republican party is continuing to work towards those aims? Sure. Well, you know, Weirich was motivated by kind of visceral anti-communism, economic libertarianism, hostility to civil rights movement, uh, hostility to women's equality as well. And um, y- y- he was, you know, radically anti-democratic. He said uh, something that actually I heard uh, Trump say. I think we all heard it, right? It was caught on radio or something. He, you know, Wyrick said uh, in 1980, I don't want everyone to vote. As a matter of fact, our leverage in the elections goes uh, up as the voting populace goes down. And this is Trump, something Trump said a few months ago on, um, on radio, I believe. Um, so, uh, so here's how he did it. He and this group of folks who's allied with a number of Southern white conservative pastors who were, including Jerry Falwell, who are closely involved with segregated schools mm-hmm. and universities. Um, uh, one of them was Bob Jones Sr., who went so far as to call segregation God's established order and referred to desegregationists as satanic propagandists who are leading colored Christians astray. As long as, the, you know, these, these religious leaders um, thought they had a right not just to segregate people, but also to receive federal money for the purpose. So they coalesced around the fear that Supreme Court might end tax exemptions for segregated Christian schools. And Wyrick was really upset about this as well. But, you know, among other issues, he was also upset about, you know, he felt like the Republican Party was too soft on communism. He was upset about school prayer issues and the like. But they really needed, they knew in order to sort of ignite a kind of hyper-conservative counter-revolution. You know, as you mentioned earlier, they wanted to be like first, you know, the, you know, the opposition, then the alternative, and then the government. So they needed a rallying cry, but they knew that like stop the tax on segregation wasn't going to be an effective one because it's so ugly, isn't it? So there's kind of fascinating episode that um, the historian Ral- Randall Balmer describes where they get together and basically went down a laundry list of issues that they thought might unite their movement. Now, this is about 1979 or so, six years after Roe versus Wade. They hadn't been particularly concerned about abortion at the time. So number one was, of course, what they viewed as the threat of, to the tax privileges, of racist academies, and there were others on the list. But then they got to abortion, and it was like a light bulb went off. And Wyrick said, you know, basically, huh, that could work. So, you know, part of the history that's really been erased by movement leadership and many conservative-leaning American voters um, is that um, people have been persuaded over time that the movement today was ignited around the issue of abortion, but that's simply not true. It wasn't. I mean, when Roe versus Wade was passed, most um, Protestant um, Republicans supported it. I mean, Betty Ford hailed it as a great, great decision. Uh, When it was passed, even the Southern Baptist Convention ran an editorial in one of their wire services hailing the decision. Mm -hmm. Um, 
Ronald Reagan, as we know, passed the most liberal abortion law in the country in 1967. Mm -hmm. um, conservative hero Barry Goldwater, who, by the way, you know, why uh, worshipped, um, he supported abortion law liberalization, at least early in his career. His wife, Peggy, was a co-founder of Planned Parenthood in Arizona. And the two of them actually arranged for an abortion for one of their, for their daughter, I think, when she was about 23 years old and was facing an unintended pregnancy. But Wyrick and, and other activists like Phyllis Schlafly, um, Schlafly in particular, saw the potential for this issue to unite the new movement. So over time, pro-choice voices were purged from the Republican Party. And today we see a kind of almost like a pro-life religion taking over this cohort. And it's, almost, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a modern creation and it was created for political purposes. Right. One of the things that is glaring to to many people um, who do not identify with that type of religious fervor in regards to abortion is the way in which someone who can be pro-life but also pro-death penalty or not or pro-family separation at the border or mm. uh, the ways in which that is not consistent. I, um, in, in the 80s, there was a movement called the Consistent Life Ethic that was pro life and also anti-death penalty and all those sorts of things that was a sort of response to that. But nonetheless, um, the ways in which we've seen it evolve today, I, I, I know I'm in the Chicago area a few, a couple of weeks ago, I was uh, running an errand um, and I saw people holding, holding anti-abortion signs on the side of the road. You know, and these are people acting with extreme religious fervor. I don't even think there was like an abortion services clinic nearby. It was just on the side of a road. I think that movement leaders know if you can get people to vote on a single issue or maybe two or three issues, you can control their vote. So they've worked really hard. You know, when, when leaders of the movement are talking to the rank and file, when they're talking to pastors about the issues, they should talk to uh, with their congregations. <clears throat> it's, you know, it's been at very, you know, and and many times in recent years, all about abortion. And we all know people who have justified their vote for Trump by saying, "Well, at least he's you know pro life. You have to vote pro life." That's you know what mm -hmm. my pastor says. It's the most important issue of our time. Um, so that's uh, one of the ways that they do it. I mean, there are a couple of other issues that really animate uh, the movement now. It's re interesting. I was recently at <clears throat> attending an event online because everything is online. Mm -hmm. um, evangelicals for Trump. And it was kind of surprising. Abortion wasn't mentioned until the 33 minute mark. Instead, it was all about religious liberty, religious liberty, religious liberty. And religious liberty was used as code for getting public funding for our organizations, tax, direct taxpayer funding, government funding of churches. This is a complete direct radical violation of the First Amendment as it's always been applied. We've never had a situation where you're getting like, you know, government paying pastor salaries or things like that. Now we have it, you know, thanks to the pandemic. Um, but they were using it a lot of different areas. There, there are a lot of ways in which the um, leaders of the movement want to open the spigots for mm -hmm. um, uh, government money flowing to churches. But abortion right. has typically been it. And I wondered like, why are they not really talking about abortion? I mean, they did talk about it at the 33 minute mark, but I also thought perhaps during the global pandemic that's killing people, and uh, efforts to sort of cast uh, sort of social distancing and mask wearing as somehow hostile to our religion. Maybe the pro-life message is something they're going to put in the back burner for the time being. But believe me, it'll come back with mm -hmm. full force. And, um, you know, I've gone um, every year for the past few years to the Evangelical for Life conference and March for Life events. And um, it's really interesting to go to those events. I think for a lot of the women in the movement, they you know, it's largely a patriarchal movement, but women know that if they want to have a path to sort of um, um, political power in that movement, they kind of have to pass through the funnel of pro-life activism. Right. It's sort of yeah. like you need to, and the, it's like they, you know, they, you know, they, they need to be the most fervent defenders of life because, you know, they, it's like the men hide behind the women. <laughs> yeah, and that's very true. And that, that, that is definitely the case in, in a, in a lot of those conservative evangelical or conservative Christian spaces mm -hmm. um, where women are only granted that level of autonomy in very particular spheres of influence. Um, another 
another common experience is that if a woman feels compelled to be a spiritual leader, she may only be allowed to teach children. Um, in mm-hmm. some, some places she may not be allowed to teach children and in other, and there's a sort of racial prejudice and colonialist uh, bent on, you could be a missionary and teach someone that is not white, but not other white men, you wouldn't be able to have authority. And that goes again back to some of the beliefs and teachings about women's submission to men in these organizations and and these communities. It's a very good point how that is a way in which women can exercise some sense of their own power uh, in those very, Mm -hmm. very tight, constricted things. And even within my my time, I, I feel like those types of organizations continue to get more constricted and the areas get more defined and smaller, unless you're a white guy. And then the, all the power is yours. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. It's almost like the promise is, you know, for like, you know, a, a, you know, the ideology, the promises for, you know, males, you have to submit to us, to your uh, authority, you know, the church leaders and sort of authorities of us, but your reward will be that you'll get a woman to submit to you. Um, it's really interesting. I mean, I, I find those, um, you know, I find those kinds of, um, ideology is really constricting it's but they're mainstream that's a funny thing like you've got Ralph Drollinger who number one advocates for women's submission but it's 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 so authoritarian he also has this whole study where he talks about you know you have a biblical duty to actually you know um uh, do physical uh uh, to, to beat your children and and a failure to do so you know if you fail to do so you're being selfish and you're you know, challenging your own, you know, future uh, in heaven, you know, it's, it's, it's incredibly, frankly, I think it's very sick. I mean, I, would, I mean, I have, I'm a mother, I would never strike my children. Right. It's just not how you get them to behave. <laughs> I, and I hear from people all the time who really struggle with that sort of uh, legacy of abuse. It just makes them feel terrible. I, you know, early in my journey in this world when I first started even before the good news club came to my kids school um in Santa Barbara this is like um 12 years ago I was living in Santa Barbara in a good news club and that's sort of how I got interested in this whole movement I had a friend so our our public school was in the same district as Westmont College which is a very well regarded evangelical college Mm -hmm. and all of my friends um who were school moms were affiliated with Westmont they were either wives of um, professors or they were professors themselves. And one of my best friends was um, a wife of a professor and she had, you know, um, a lot of kids and she, you know, was a wonderful person uh, in many regards, but she, I think kind of fell down the sort of path of a kind of fundamentalist theology. And at a certain point we're on one of our walks and she just shocked me. She said, I beat my children and I hit them hard enough because I want and to hurt and I want them to fear the Lord. I want them to fear the Lord and I want them to fear authority. And I just couldn't believe it. And then she started describing how one of her daughters, she said, but I'm really worried because one of them is starting to become very masochistic and saying, mommy, mommy, I'm so bad. You, you have to beat me. And I just thought, well, what do you expect that you're doing to your children? When you, when you beat them, you're going to warp them and, and, and 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 screw up screw their minds i mean it, it was just so disturbing and upsetting mm-hmm. and um and really kind of astonishing and um and and then it was only a little bit later when i started reading the works of james dobson who advocates physical punishment and then um you know daniel pearl and some of these other fundamentalists who actually advocate for beating your children so that they fear authority and fear the lord um, you know, it's a way of making, turning people fearful and authoritarian and mm. making them, and, you know, as I was writing my book, I kept coming across pastors who would describe this very ritualized forms of abuse that they would subject their own children to. And it was just one of the most disturbing aspects of, of the research and, and reading that I did. I, um, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. very, it's very troubling. And I hear, as I'm sure you do, from people who have survived this and come out of it, and it's really screwed them up. It's in in multiple ways, and you know, then they spend you know 
much of their lives trying to sort of um, shake this, you know, feeling that they're bad and this feeling of, um, you know, the sort of dysfunction that this type of right. abuse inculcates in them. Yeah, yeah. And coupled with teachings of things like original sin and um, total depravity and, and all those types of beliefs, uh, it, it reinforces that for sure. Yeah, and I don't want to suggest that all people, uh, conservative uh, uh, folks, are, are beating their children, you know, far from it. This is just describing, of course, a segment of that movement, although I do think it's shocking that, you know, folks like Ralph Dollinger, who has such an, um, you know, uh, a, a broad and powerful platform, is advocating for it. Right. You, right. And what I do think is important, though, uh, what I do think is important is the way in which these things that are hard to necessarily identify or name, they have become these types of cultural norms and these things that are accepted and general practice in a lot of communities and by a lot of individuals. Uh, and that is actually one of the one one of the ways in which the the groundwork has been laid through things like education. And you touch on that in a couple of different ways in power worshipers. One of them is by talking about um, the ways in which American history has been recast as this, as this Christian type of redemption story uh, by people like David Barton, and then as well as very specific moves, lobbying efforts by the, by the now Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos and her family. So education and the ways in which these groups try to form young minds, um, it's not dis it's inherently connected to the types of behaviors that you saw in your in your friend. In that regard, what did you learn about David Barton and his and his goals? I know that like I I went to a Christian college. I was I didn't read David Barton, but I did I did there was one particular book that I had to read as part of my American history course. I was a history major. And one of them was called The Light and the Glory. And it was all about Christian, uh, like America as a Christian nation. And it was very colored by these sorts of things that I can now name. Um, I didn't as a young 19 year old as things like Christian reconstructionism and dominionism. I can now name those things, but I couldn't then. So that's, I'm sorry, that's a little bit of a, there's a, that's a tangent there. But returning back to the ways in which People are developing, like Barton, are developing curriculum and affecting even federal curriculums and why education is so important to these groups to continue to propagate their, their access to power and their ability to exercise authority. Yeah, well, you get the kids, you get the culture, right? I remember Matt Staver at one event I went to saying, you know, he's the head of the Liberty Council. It's one of the right wing uh, legal advocacy groups saying, if you want to change the direction of the cruise ship, you get to target that age group. I think he said like five to 12 or something, or maybe four to 14. He said is the most strategic age group that we have. Um, they actually refer to children as strategic machinery. So, I mean, this goes back to, you know, David Barton and this sort of Christian nation myth. I mean, he tells, uh, you know, as you know, he's a, a, a sort of hyper conservative, um, quote unquote, historian whose works have been debunked many times. Um, but he tells the religious right stories that they want to hear. The stories are fundamentally false or often misleading. You know, there's sometimes, you know, some truth in them, but then there's sort of misleading context. But, you know, that doesn't stop him or them the fact that he is often criticized even by um, uh, evangelical professors, you know, con at conservative evangelical colleges. Um, these myths are necessary to provide cover for the great lie at the center of uh, the Christian nationalist movement. What Barton and other leaders of the movement don't want us to know is that America was proudly created by our founders as the world's first secular republic. Um, uh, now, you know, he, in his telling, the founders were, in fact, Bible thumpers and stent, you know, intent on establishing a conservative Christian nation. But it's really untrue. I mean, America today is diverse, but even at the time of the revolution, it was always, you know, also really diverse. Um, 
you know, the colonial period, we had Lutherans, Catholics, Congregationalists, Unitarians, Presbyterians, and a whole bunch of other sects, um, many of which hated each other. Um, uh, it also included a number of doubters or non-believers. So the idea that mm -hmm. America ever had a single unified religion is false. Yeah, in, in my education, uh, it was the people that were hailed as the example, the, the prime American Christian example were, was the Puritans which is odd because they have a very <laughs> checkered record. They're not by any means entirely laudatory or they, you know, they even had practices that I think purity culture um, and abstinence and that sort of thing would, would be uncertain about <laughs> <laughs> uh, by today's standards. Um, but nonetheless, that was the example. But to your point, it was, um, it, it was far more diverse than that. And it, but those types of schools, the schools, the Christian schools and other places, they do not teach that. It's uh, pretty black and white uh, in, in comparison. There's Christian and secular or Christian and non-Christian. Uh, and uh, non-Christians are demonized or seen as a threat. Mm, indeed. I, I think that, um, you know, the, the, the movement reserves a special contempt for secularists who are mm -hmm. cast as being, you know, out there ransacking everything that's holy good and good in society. But, you know, the movement also throws in a lot of progressive Christians in that sort of bucket along with secularists and calls, you know, says this is all false theology and, you know, this is new age religion. This isn't Christianity. Very interesting. Yeah. One of the other connections that you that you make in the book to these these folks, uh, and this is another another individual that has been been covered extensively in books and other places, is uh, Rush Dooney, and then he also leaned on another person from the past, uh, Dab Dabney. I'm I'm sorry, I'm blanking on his first name. It's his all first... right. Yeah, Robert Louis Dabney. Robert Boy. Louis Dabney. Thank you. Yeah. Oh my God, I fell down. Uh, a sort of Rush Dooney rabbit hole when I was researching this book. It was this incredibly um, influential and incredibly prolific mid-century theologian. Um, and uh, so, you know, he, he, he admired Thornwell and Dabney, who were these pro-slavery theologians, and he quoted them ex affirmatively in a number of his works, um, but he not only did that, he reprinted some of Dabney's works through his own publishing house, Ross House, I mean, Ross house Books. Um, and Rush Dooney was the, uh, founded an organization called the Chalcedon Organization, it's a Christian, uh, sort of Christian Reconstructionism. Uh, so I, I wanna talk a little bit about first Dabney and Thornwell, the pro-slavery theologians. Mm -hmm. And then I wanna sort of explain the through line between them and then Rush Dooney and then the movement leaders today. So these pro-slavery theologians were intensely hostile to the principle of equality, pluralism, and critical thinking. They endorsed an austere political, uh, uh, biblical literalism uh, and rigid hierarchies, which they asserted were ordained by God. The United States, that the, US, the, the idea of the United States is a Christian nation um, chosen by God, that it should be an Orthodox Christian Republic um, that at some point America has deviated horribly from its mission and fallen under the control of atheist and or liberal elites. Does this sound familiar? I mean, <laughs> these are the <laughs> ideas that the pro-slavery theologians endorsed. They said there are these hierarchies ordained by God, uh, white people over black people and men over women. So this is how Thornwell uh, of South Carolina, uh, he and Dabney were both um, South Carolina members, of the, I guess the Presbyterian church in South Carolina. And Thornwell described the conflict this way. He said, the partisans conflict are not merely abolitionists and slaveholders. So he was writing around the time when there was a struggle over emancipation. He said, they're atheists, communists, um, socialists on the one side and friends of order and regulated freedom on the other. So here he's identifying order and regulated freedom within slavers and atheists mm -hmm. with abolitionists. So um, Dabney too said a whole bunch of awful things. You know, he expressed, by the way, contempt for public education because he didn't think white people should have to pay taxes to support 
uh, the education of black children who he expressed in the most disgusting terms, I'm not even gonna repeat them. He said a ton of other bad things too. <laughs> he cast, he was a very hostile to science. He said the physical sciences were theories of unbelief and atheistic and unchristian. So these are the folks that Rush Dini chose to not only cite in his works, but also uh, reprint through his uh, Ross House books, which is a, I think it may have been, I'm not sure if it's a division of Chalcedon or if it was Chalcedon adjacent, adjacent, but it was his own publishing house. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like theirs included an opposition to government assistance to the poor he was incredibly hostile to public education he actually published like a huge screed called the messianic character of american education it's like i don't know how many pages it is like 300 pages or even longer i have it over there in my uh in my book uh bookcase it's like this long really thick screed against public education um mm -hmm. And these are cornerstones of Christian nationalism today. So in particular, Rush Dooney wrote that the First Amendment, you know, um, aimed to establish freedom, not, you know, he wrote, quote, not from religion, but for religion. So we hear this phrase widely parroted by Christian nationalists of today. People like David Bart are saying it all the time, and it's become an article of faith for the rank and file. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and, and other phrases of Rush Dini's, um, the idea that um, social welfare programs or something like slavery to the state, these are other phrases that other Christian nationalist leaders today um, echo. Right. And it's more important than ever to to highlight the the racist roots of, of things like this uh, and understand, given the the massive national reckoning that an overdue reckoning that we're having with these these ties um but it is something that as you point out in your book many current leaders do try to distance themselves from rush Dooney, even while still espousing his beliefs in other ways and not really it's a pretty soft distancing they likely don't always vocally repudiate rush Dooney, right because he's such a such a powerful figurehead mm -hmm. uh, at this point. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, it hits home the fact that the religious right in America is not really separable from race and racism, no matter how hard its leaders try to do so. And they really do try. I mean, lead, heads of the leading religious right policy groups <clears throat> and their affiliated organizations, I'm thinking about um, uh, organizations like Family Research Council, are, are making an effort to offer the appearance of diversity to their movement. They're always reaching out to uh, conservative leaning pastors of color in order to capture a subsection of voters of color. Um, and they do make a special effort, uh, for instance, with conservative Latino voters of faith um, in certain swing districts in particular. <clears throat> but the fact remains that for substantial numbers of white supporters of the movement, the idea of religious heritage is closely bound up with ideas of racial heritage and mm -hmm. racial difference. And of course, you know, religious right leaders are fighting the culture wars on behalf of a political party that promotes race-based voter suppression and race-based gerrymandering. I mean, that uh, the sort of race-based voter suppression is astonishing. We've seen what happened recently in, I think it's Kentucky and also in, um, in Georgia to see how uh, black voters uh, have been completely disenfranchised. So not only do these movement leaders paper over the ways in which hyper-conservative religion, racism, reinforce one another, they've actually thrown their support wholeheartedly behind Trump, who appeals directly to the racism of his supporters. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, leads, your mention of gerrymandering, I think that leads very well into where I'd like to bring things back to the present day and the sorts of very sophisticated efforts that are enacted by Christian nationalist groups. Um, two that you highlight in the book are 
Project Blitz and United in Purpose. Mm. Um, and the reasons why I think they're valuable to highlight is because, because I, I do think that a lot of people that serve as this sort of public face of, of the religious right or Christian nationalist, nationalists or evangelicals and, and those types of people overlap, you know, whether they, t- whether they choose those labels or not. They, they do try to put on these affectations of being, having simple desires and simple wishes and things like religious freedom, as you mentioned, right. as being, they as being. They just want to save the babies. <laughs> right. They want to save the babies. They, they just, they want to practice their religion, even if that means arguing something all the way up to the Supreme Court in order to secure the right disc- to discriminate against someone, as has mm-hmm. happened multiple times. Mm-hmm. But these examples in your book illustrate the complexity and the intelligence and the drive to maximize their return on um, on their ability to affect elections and to reach out and get out the vote and all of these other aspects of governance. Can you talk a little bit about what you learned about United and Purpose uh, and and Project Blitz? Um, these are two different efforts, but they they both are very data driven, uh, very sophisticated, modern campaigns. Yeah. So let's first talk about Project Blitz, and then we'll talk about United and Purpose. Mm -hmm. So Project Blitz is a broad and ambitious legislative initiative. And by the way, they're linked, and we'll get to that later. So Project Blitz is a broad uh, initiative uh, targeting uh, state legislatures that aims to flood multiple state legislatures with coordinated simultaneous bills in the hopes that they will eventually become law. There's literally a Project Blitz playbook, and I write about it in my book. The documentation of the Blitz shows that the movement leaders have self-consciously embraced a strategy of advancing their goals through deception and indirection. You know, for, for many years, critics have warned that concessions to the Christian right on symbolic issues like erecting public monuments or emblazoning religious mottos on state property, for example, would set the nation on a course leading to the establishment of religion. And a lot of people are like, oh, what does it matter? They just want to do and God we trust here. Well, we now know that the critics were right because the architects of Project Blitz show in their documentation that their aim is to push the states down a slippery slope to a more biblically based society. Um, So the project blitz have divided, you know what ALEC is, right? The American Legislative Exchange Council, they craft uh, model legislation for um, uh, state politicians to adopt so they don't have to research and write the bills themselves. And then they can uh, introduce identical bills into multiple state legislatures at the same, same time. And that's what Project Blitz does. Um, The architects of the Blitz have divided legislation into three categories according to level of difficulty. The first level is all about those symbolic issues like putting in God we trust signs in public schools and on police cars and in public buildings. So now in multiple states, a lot of the, the, those in God we trust bills have been adopted in multiple states Um, including Mississippi, Louisiana, Alabama, Tennessee, a whole bunch of others. In God We Trust signs are, have to be, by law, prominently placed in every public school building or even in every public school classroom. But that's just phase one. I mean, as the architects of the Blitz make clear, the point of phase one is just to clear the path for phase two and phase three, which both of which consists of bills that um, are injecting Christianity, or I should say Christian nationalist, conservative Christian ideas more directly into schools and government entities and to legalize discrimination against those, um, you know, uh, faith-based discrimination, Mm -hmm. Um, especially uh, uh, discrimination against those whose actions are very being uh, offend the sensibilities of conservative Christians that sort of, Religious freedom is never intended for folks like me who might anchor our own uh, sincerely held beliefs in our own sense of, you know, deeply held conscience. So, mm-hmm. um, so some of the architects of Project Blitz, the people who are considered the sort of, um, you know, four sponsors of the Blitz are deeply embedded in United and Purpose. I'm thinking about David Barton, who I actually call the Where's Waldo of the Christian Nationalist Movement <laughs> everywhere. No, he's everywhere. He's on the sits on the boards of so many initiatives and policy groups and you know legislative initiatives. 
Um, and then a, a fellow named United, uh, Bill Dallas, who's a founder of United and Purpose. So mm -hmm. what is United and Purpose? It's a data organization and it targets conservative churches and others in order to help um, uh, turn out the vote for uh, hyper-conservative candidates that the movement favors. So United and Purpose is really quite secretive, but what the leaders have revealed, including Bill Dallas and the interviews that they've given, is that their data organization has a massive reach. In an interview with the Christian Broadcasting Network, for instance, uh, Dallas, said, we have about 200 million fi voter files. So we've pretty much the whole voting population in our database. And what we do is we track to see what's going to make either vote someone one way or not vote at all. Think about mm. that. They target people to figure out whether they're going to vote one way or not vote at all. And they, they, they're really involved in the get out the vote initiative. So they, they have all this data and it includes some psychograph, like, um, you know, whether a person has ever signed a marriage, uh, uh, like an anti-marriage equality list or an anti-abortion list, or whether a person goes to church on a regular basis, or even if a person is a fan of NASCAR or fishing, like they mm -hmm. try and get like all these things. And they, um, as Dallas has described it, they assign points to people, you know, for certain interests. And as Bill Dallas says, if your score, if your score of, you know, the points totaled over 600 points, we realized you were very serious about your faith and we run that person against the voter registration database. If they're not registered, that becomes one of the key people we're gonna target to go after. And here's another thing they do. They do a lot of it through churches. So a division of United and Purpose was working with um, conservative churches, giving tools to pastors to help them get their congregants out to vote. And they had um, tools that would help um, compare uh, pastors have the ability to compare congregant lists with voter rolls and see who voted in the last election. And if they hadn't voted, figuring out like how to target them with certain kinds of messages to get them to turn out to vote. So it's a really sophisticated um, uh, initiative and uh, you know, offering a series of very sophisticated tools. You know, when people wonder why uh, and by the way, George Barna, the evangelical pollster, was also mm -hmm. deeply embedded in United and Purpose. And if you wonder why those sage cons are voting at such high numbers, and, and like, you know, 91% voted in 2016, 90% voted for Trump, you wonder why. And I think uh, United and Purpose is a, is a big part of that. Mm -hmm. And do you think, uh, on, on Barna, and one follow-up in regards to, to that group, um, they often are cited even in uh, news agencies that may not cater to a religious conservative audience. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that that is intentional or, and do you think that that, that is in, in effect sort of damaging to how evangelicals or Christian nationalists are represented in broader uh, media outlets uh, because they tend to be favorable to the goals. I, I inherently distrust the Barna polls. <laughs> I don't know if that's how you feel. Um, well, I think some of his polls are, 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 are right. I mean, his whole, you know, identification of the sage cons, you know, I've heard over and over at a lot of the gatherings that, um, you know, all it takes is 10% of the population to change the culture. And Barna's data, um, you know, I think he identified a core of what they call sage cons. That, these are not just people who turn out to vote themselves. These are the people who will try and agitate within their churches to get their congregations to vote on saving the babies. These are folks who are gonna like knock door to door. He identifies it as uh, like 20 to uh, 25 million Americans, that sort of core 10%. I think from a political voting perspective, that may be a, a bit too low. If you look at the work of uh, folks like Samuel Perry and Andrew Whitehead, in their book about Christian nationalism, they estimate the number is closer to say 30 million. Um, they've also done a, a really wonderful job of identifying who qualifies as Christian nationalist, at least in a kind of a loose way. Mm -hmm. um, so, but that's but those numbers aren't terribly far off, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think I think you can sort of pick and choose. But you know, when it comes to like listening to uh, these leaders, I think that you know it's people have asked me, is this is this um, a conspiracy, you know? Uh, conspiracies happen under the cover of darkness with unnamed actors. It's like, 
this is a movement that's operating out in the open. And it's not that they're hiding, it's that we're not listening. I think we need to listen to these leaders and take them at their word. They've been telling us for years that they want to destroy the separation of church and state and quote unquote, return our country to a time that frankly never was. And I, I think we need to, um, to pay attention to what they're saying before it's too late. Absolutely. How do you think people listening to this or reading your book or, and, or people that are concerned about this sort of threat that these, these groups pose to democracy? Um, so how can we work to diminish that sort of power, both fiscally and politically and all, all the different ways in which um, these, these groups operate? Uh, how can people like you and I or uh, even people listening to the show respond to those sorts of things because it's it feels big, it feels vague, it feels all encompassing. It it it's natural to have like a sort of you know anxious response to this sort of stuff. But well, we should be encouraged that we actually have the numbers. I mean, the challenges we're facing are political, and the solutions are political too. There is mm. no substitute for the power of the vote. If they're voting in disproportionate numbers, well, those that's free to us too. I mean, one thing the religious right does well is they've created a really positive voting culture. They're not doing a lot of, oh, your vote doesn't really matter. Oh, let's vote for this third party candidate. No, they really know when unity is necessary. And they also know, um, you know, that it's not just about the front runner. You know, that person might have said something stupid in 1982 or done something dumb in, you know, 1989. But you know what? It doesn't matter whether the front runner is your uh, favorite candidate. It's really about, you know, look at the judges, look at the people they're going to appoint cabinet to run cabinets. Are they going to appoint somebody in in, in charge of public health who's a science denier? I mean, just Mm -hmm. it's really simple stuff. And um, I think we need to sort of they've trained their, you know, rank and file to vote on um, on these larger issues. And I think um, if if we can sort of unify at the, um, you know, when it matters, uh, not just in national elections, but also in local elections too, that really matters. So there are things we can do as individuals, you know, such as hold, holding ourselves in our circles, members of our family or, you know, faith groups or, um, uh, you know, other groups uh, to vote. Um, and holding them accountable and volunteering to get out the vote. But there are also things, you know, your, your, your activism doesn't end with a vote. We should, you know, elect great people and then hold them accountable for um, uh, following through on their campaign promises. And also I think there are things that we can achieve if we join together. I mean, you know, protecting voting rights is massive. I think it's really the challenge of our time. Um, uh, uh, getting involved in media and messaging platforms is really important. Um, getting involved in think tanks where possible, donating our money where possible to organizations that support the separation of, of church and state. I mean, I think we're at an all hands on deck moment mm-hmm. and uh, we all have to do our part. Yeah, yeah. Well, Catherine, thank you so much for for talking to me about about your work and your book. Where can people find the book? Where can they find you online or elsewhere? Oh, thanks so much for uh, giving me the opportunity to plug my book, The Power Worshippers. Please purchase a copy. Um, And you can uh, uh, contact me through my website, which is katherinestewart.me. I archive a lot of my journalism on that website, too. I'm on Twitter at Kath S. Stewart. There are two S's. And um, I always really love to hear from people. So please don't hesitate to... Um, send me a question or tell me about your own experiences. It's really nice to hear from people in this other way, you know, even in the midst of this awful mm-hmm. pandemic that's keeping everyone yes. at home. Yes, and I, I do appreciate you taking the time during, again, this this pandemic uh, to to talk with me about about your work. It's a, it's a vital uh, book, and I'm glad to be able to uh, share this conversation and, and the book with uh, with others. So thank you very much. Thanks so much.
And that'll do it for this week's episode. This episode was produced by Jake Lewis. The theme music is by Dave LaFever and Jake Lewis. If you enjoy this conversation, please rate and review Powers and Principalities on Apple Podcasts and let others know about the show. You can also support the show by purchasing Catherine's book from the link in the show notes and by signing up for a paid prescription to my newsletter, The Post Evangelical Post, at postevangelicalpost.com. Talk to you soon. First Corinthians warned you about the women with a loud mouth, and this podcast is just that. Here at the Speaking in Church podcast, we talk all about the regular people and the things that regularly happen to them in the evangelical church. It's a podcast about change. It's a podcast about seeking moral high ground. And it's a podcast for people who are just trying to deconstruct on the safe side. You can listen wherever you get your podcast, And if you want to be a guest, yes, you, regular person, you can be a guest on the Speaking in Church podcast. If you want to come on, just let us know.